the manifesto. And I can't think of a better place to launch a digital freedom manifesto than Republica and Berlin. So, date. How do you like Berlin? Well, my career started in Austria in, in 1987, and I came to Berlin to get a record deal for BMG, and they didn't sign me. And um, I flew over the wall, and it just intrigued me so much that I, I spent um, a lot of time going back and forth uh, behind the Berlin Wall, because I realized that those people weren't free. I um, actually met three girls behind the Berlin Wall, and um, they said they knew me as David Hasselhoff. I said, the guy who talks to the car. And they thought I was crazy. And they said, no, you are the man who sings of freedom. So uh, this was in July. So I um, took a picture with them. I said, meet me here tomorrow at 12.30. And I left uh, East Berlin and went across the border, put that picture in the West Berlin newspaper. And then the next day, I brought it back to the girls. And then the wall came down on November 9th, as you know, in 1989. Um, recently, I just came back for two reasons. One, to uh, protest the fall of the East Side Gallery, because I think it's incredibly important that we keep the memory alive of the people who fought for freedom in East Berlin. I, uh, yeah. You know, I just finished a special for the National Geographic, and I found out the most incredible stuff. There were 70,000 people in prison in East Germany, and I met guys who were in Stasi prison camps. Um, they had no privacy, and they had no freedom, and that's what we're talking about today, is digital privacy and digital freedom. So, it kind of all ties together. And that's exactly why, why we are so happy to have David as our ambassador, because here's a guy who's been fighting for freedom all his life. And if somebody knows about losing your privacy, well, David Hasselhoff knows about <laughs> losing his privacy. I've spent two days with David now, and it's incredible. Like, we walk down Berlin, and cars, cars screech to a halt, and there's everybody taking photos left and right. You have no privacy when you are someone like David Hasselhoff. And that's something that people, normal people on the street, people online today, they can't really experience it, but they can be worried about it. And that's something we want to want to address today. But before we go into that, David, what's the real story about you and the wall going down? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm asked that question so much. Um, I had nothing to do with the wall coming down. <laughs> sing a song about freedom. And now my new song will be, I've been looking for digital freedom. <laughs> you know, I found out on my last tour that when I went, um, I, I saw a lot of pictures of the audience, a sign saying, thank you for the Mauer fall. And I, I actually thought it was a joke. You know, I, I thought, well, this is a joke, but it's not. It, I, I'm now doing a special um, kind of about the song Freedom, because freedom is most, one of the most important words in the world. And that song, Looking for Freedom, is known all over the world. And um, so my relationship with the wall really is just a song. I happen to have a song that was number one when the wall came down, and that was it. And the kids over there said that they used it, they were little kids, you know, then they sang it like a little anthem, because it had the word freedom, which I think freedom and privacy of what today is about. And freedom and privacy is something this audience understands very well. So, David, what do you think are the two most important innovations of our time? Well, it's the internet and mobile phones. Yep. And I think that's pretty much it. The internet and the mobile phone. Yeah, there's been lots of innovations. And then I run a car. <laughs> <laughs> But the internet really changed the world. And the mobile phone, of course, changed the world as well. And, and we, we got so much good out of both of these innovations. So much communication capability, so much entertainment, so much connectivity. But now we've learned that these two innovations, the greatest innovations we've had, have also been turned into tools of surveillance. They've been 
turn back to us people. And that's what we want to talk about. We want to get people to understand how the world has changed and how our own governments and foreign governments are using the internet and the mobile phones against us. Now, how do you think people feel when they learn about these things? Well, for me, it's totally affected my life because about six years ago, when something very private happened in my home. My daughter took a photograph of me when I was not at my best, and it went all over the world. It, it hit 11 million internet users probably in, in three or four days. Now it's probably up to 100. And I've spent a lot of my time trying to get that off the internet. And it didn't bother me as much as it bothered my daughter. And it bothered me because I broke her heart and hurt her feelings. And she, they accused my daughter of putting the tape out. It was hacked. It was hacked from her computer. And one of the reasons I'm here, and I talked to my daughter before I came here, and I said, you know, this is going to bring this up again. Because I'm over it, and uh, so is she. But I said, now's the time to bring this up because it's happening to everybody now. <clears throat> because the surveillance now says they get into your email, they get into your texts, they can get into your photographs, and um, your contracts, your finances, just about anything. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here is to talk about what we can do to stop that. And frankly, what can we do? Well, there are different things people can do. I mean, we can talk about technical means, like how do, how do you encrypt your email? How do you make sure you have a functional VPN? How do you make sure that your hard drive is encrypted? How do you use Tor? But of course, these all help. And we promote all of these mechanisms that people, people can use on their computers and on their phones. But these technical means, they don't really change the core problem. The core problem is that internet is being used to watch over our daily lives. And this is something that it was never meant to be used for. And it simply isn't right. Just because something is technically doable doesn't make it right. And the main justification for monitoring people's communications and saving our data forever is that it can be done. Data has become so cheap that did you know that it's actually now cheaper to keep data than to delete data? No. <laughs> it's very simple. If you want to delete data, you have to check classified. Like, what do I want to save? What can I delete? That takes manpower. It's cheaper nowadays to simply keep everything because data is so cheap. Hard drives have become so cheap. And that's how the surveillance state can save our data forever. Practically forever. And one thing that people feel when they learn about these things, for example, when the Snowden leaks came out, the people learned about how foreign intelligence agencies are collecting mass quantities of data, how they are tapping underwater inter intercontinental data lines with nuclear submarines, and how they are storing all this data in the largest data center on the planet. When people hear about things like these, they feel like there's nothing they could do. There's nothing they could do. They're, they become hopeless. And they sort of give up. They sort of surrender. And that is understandable, because there's nothing that immediately comes to mind you can do about it. These technical safeguards will help, but what helps even better is political change. People saying no. People standing up and saying that this is not okay. People telling their decision makers and politicians that we didn't build the internet for this purpose. So one thing that I know you have as a uh, cooperation with is cooperation with Google, right? Yeah, there's so many great things about the internet. It's, um, I um, was asked on April Fool's Day, which is a big holiday around the world, to uh, take some photographs. And uh, if you, uh, it was Auto Awesome, which was on the Google homepage, if you hit hashtag Hothsome, a picture of me would come back with one of your photographs. And um, there was 30 million. I mean, it hit 30 million people. And there was like 27 impressions on Twitter. So there's so much good about the internet, you know, that, that frankly, I can't, that, that frankly, I, I can't. 
what you're telling me now is kind of scary, you know, because um, I think like the theme of Night Riders, one man can make a difference, and I think the only way we can make a difference is if we all band together and sort this out, you know, um, because what happened to me it has happened to a lot of people, and um, just the other day, when I met Miko, he said, your name came up in a virus. And I said, well, I feel fine. <laughs> no, not that kind of a virus, but it's true. We actually have analyzed in our labs several years ago a virus which was referred to, to David Hasselhoff. It had some functions which were named David Hasselhoff. We don't know why, but of course, when you are David Hasselhoff, you get tied into all weird connections. Um, I'm talking about Knight Rider and Kit and Google. I understood they actually, at Google's office, took you into a self-driving car. Yeah, they're picking, they're making a self-driving car at Google, and they have the Hoff Award. And the Hoff Award is the award they give to people who have perseverance and really work the hardest. There's about, I think, over maybe 100, 130 people working on the, this amazing car, and they picked me up at the airport in a self-driving car, and they basically just said, "Hit on." which is like cruise control, and I hit on, and the car drove itself. Well, that must be very familiar to you. Actually, it was very scary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had anxiety just thinking about it. And then I happened to run into Sergey, and uh, he basically said, take him out in the real car, so they took me out the one that changes lanes and has uh, schematic blueprints of everything. Everything that Kit was doing now, 30 years, 30 years, oh my God. 30 years, I'm still alive. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> wow, that's good though, yes. 30 years ago, everything that Mike Sheffield, Mike Sheffy built the car is coming true. And um, now, in maybe two years, they're going to be able to put in this blueprint, somatic blueprint, that, that schematic blueprint, that's gonna be able to be put in any car. So. My dream is to actually put it in a Knight Rider car <laughs> and drive around the world. And, and maybe call the car from your watch, uh, which is also happening, of course, with the new watches where you can actually use it as a phone. So pretty much the technical details that you were forecasting with Knight Rider 30 years ago have become reality. But so has something else which was forecasted to happen in 1980s, which was Orville's book, 1984. And like I've said before, in many ways, Orwell was an optimist. Most of the worst things he was forecasting that would happen in a surveillance state have happened, and even worse things have happened. Because now, through the internet, not just what we communicate can be intercepted, even what we think can be intercepted. And that's especially easy to see through services like Google Search. Because when you go to Google Search or Bing Search or any search engine, you're completely honest. You will type in exactly what you think. We don't lie to the internet. The internet and whoever sees what we type into search engines, including the search engine companies and of course the intelligence agencies, they will eventually end us knowing us better than our families know us. And that is a scary thought. So today, to fight these problems, we're 